Hi, welcome to Parkway Hills Baptist Church. We journey together to glorify God, making disciples of every generation, and serving the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To learn more about us, visit us online at parkwayhills.org. We're glad you're here and enjoy the message. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're going to be in verses 15 to 21 this morning as we continue really in this series for this week, and then we're going to take a little bit of a break next week um, as we kind of enter into the Christmas season more officially on Sunday mornings. But this week we're talking about this series, Kingship Revealed. And we've been in this series for a little while, and it's these moments in the story of Jesus that Matthew brings to light where it is very clear that what's happening is revealing Jesus as the Messiah, as the one they had anticipated, the one to come. And we're going to see that again this morning as Matthew really brings to light this passage of Scripture from Isaiah chapter 42, this prophecy about Jesus and how he's fulfilling this right before their very eyes. And in the prophecy, we'll see this word hope. And hope, and we've talked about this before a little bit, especially this time of year, we think about things that we hope for, right? As maybe presents begin to be wrapped and slid under the tree in your home and kids look around and go, boy, I hope it's this, right? Here's my list, the things I starred, circled, underlined, all that. That's what I really want, and I hope that's under the tree. But it's not only for kids. All of us do that, right? We all kind of hope for things, And we think oftentimes that if we get that thing that we hope for, it's going to make such a difference in our lives, right? And you think about that, maybe if there's this relationship that I really want with another person, and if if I just have this relationship, if we could just start dating or whatever that may look like, well, then that surely is going to bring me kind of this happiness that I desire. Or maybe it's not a relationship, maybe it's just the new iPhone 12, Right, because that fulfills every wish and desire. You just ask Siri and she does it for you. Now, as a matter of fact, you end up saying, well, it looks really similar to the one I had before. It just has a better camera. Right? But maybe it's not just something like that. Maybe it's even a raise at work and you think, if we just had this raise, I would enjoy my job more because I could really engage if I was making more money and my family would be more secure. And we put whatever we could into that slot that we say, I hope in this. And what we find is oftentimes, even when we receive those things, they never deliver on what they promise. There's never the peace and the rest that we think will finally come if I just get to this point. And what we're going to see this morning, it is only in Jesus that we find hope truly fulfilled. So would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word this morning? And just invite those at home also, if you would stand right there in your living room, in honor of reading these words this morning, if you're physically able to do so. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 15. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen... My beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. Father, would you speak to us through these words this morning? And by the power of your spirit, would you shape us to look more like Jesus today? And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. One of the first things we see in this passage, literally what we just read there in verse 15, is says Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And we begin to see that really the mission continues on what Jesus has come for. So he encounters this issue, we'll see in just a moment, with the Pharisees and the religious leaders, but it does not stop him from doing what he came to do. And as a matter of fact, the Scripture then tells us what he came to do 
was to preach the good news, was to offer salvation. He healed those who were with him. And Matthew kind of gives this, this summary that as he withdrew from the place that he was, that the crowds followed him. And as they brought those who were sick and those who had diseases and, and all kinds of issues, that he began to heal them. And yet he charged them not to tell anyone because his time had not yet come. But it's interesting in that verse 15, and we kind of have to ask the question, why is he withdrawing from there, as the Scripture tells us? Well, if we were to back up, we would begin to understand kind of the stage of what's happening there. You see, a few weeks ago, Pastor Joe preached through this passage, and we kind of got out of order because of some sickness on our team and sermons that were prepared and all that kind of stuff. But it's the message, essentially, if you remember it, over the Sabbath. And Jesus proclaims himself the Lord of the Sabbath, and he really hacked the Pharisees off because there were these moments where Jesus healed on the Sabbath, which was against what they had come to understand and proclaim was their law at that point. And so they're frustrated with Jesus, and Jesus proclaims that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's even teaching in their synagogues. And to sum all that up in verse 14, right before what we read, it says this, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. How to destroy him. And that's why he withdraws from there and continues his ministry. But it begs the question, why were they so intent on destroying Jesus? I mean, he's healing people in their midst. What was it about Jesus that made them so intent that they wanted to destroy him? Because we also have to see that this wasn't the first time somebody had arisen in that time period and said, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm the guy you've all been looking for. There had been actually multiple people who had come and done that. Even the scripture in Acts chapter 5 tells us of those who have risen up and proclaimed themselves to be the Messiah. Now here's the story with it. So this is after Jesus has died on the cross, after he has been resurrected, and the disciples now are going out in his name, and the church is beginning to grow. And we get to this point in Acts chapter 5 where two of his disciples get arrested, and they're wondering what they should do with them. And so as they're kind of, as a council, religiously walking through this process, this one guy stands up and he says, hey, we probably ought to be careful. His name is Gamaliel, and I'll read you his words. He said, he said to the men of Israel, take care with what you're about to do with these men. For the poor, the, before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. It says, so they took his advice. And what that shows us is there had been several who had been raised up or had raised themselves up, I should say, proclaiming to be the Messiah. But yet, in this case, it was the Pharisees themselves, the Jewish people themselves, who said, we are intent to destroy Jesus. And I think it's important for us to understand why. The scripture really gives us indications all over the place that we can kind of summarize in three things of why they wanted to destroy Jesus. And the first is this. We read often in the text these moments where it says they were amazed at Jesus because he spoke with such authority. When Jesus taught, he taught real truth and he possessed real authority. It wasn't handed to them by anyone there. It wasn't that he had gone to all the right religious schools. It was that Jesus by who he was, has authority. Not only did he have authority, but we just saw it even in the context of this, as the crowd is following him and they're bringing those who are sick and ill, he's healing them, which means he's got this supernatural ability. So not only does he have the authority, but he has the power. It's demonstrated all over the place. But there's one other thing. Not only the authority and the power, but Jesus in claiming to be the Messiah and proving it by his life and his works means that he also has the position. And if you're a religious leader of the day, isn't that what you want? The authority and the power and the position. 
And I think it would have been okay if Jesus had come and just submitted under the rule and the system and the workings of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, but he was outside of that because Jesus was altogether different and it was stirring everything up. But before we're too hard on the Pharisees, isn't it the same struggle that we have? I mean, the mantra of our day is this, that you live your own truth, right? You've got what works for you, you live that out. And essentially what we're saying in that is, is I want to be my own authority. I want to tell myself what's right and wrong, and I'm going to live in such a way that I feel what's right in this moment. I'm going to do that regardless of what anybody else feels or says, because this is my truth for the moment. And Jesus stands and says, no, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And sometimes it's not just the authority piece of it, but it's the power piece of it, right? Because we long to have that power in our lives where we would say, I am the master of my own future. I am the one who flies this plane. I drive this car. I direct my own life. And we want the power to be able to do that. And so we gain that in any sense that we can in this world. And then the third thing is the position. And this really comes back as Jesus truly Lord. Or do I just kind of bring him along on this journey that I decide the direction to go? Because it's really easy sometimes for us to creep upon that throne in our own lives and become the Lord. Jesus had all authority, power, and position. And here is, I think, what is amazing. What did he do with all of it? Back in verse 17. It says this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And here is the prophet, literally the words of the Lord spoken through Isaiah. Now Matthew is bringing this to light and he says, Behold my servant, the Lord speaking of Jesus of the Messiah, behold my servant whom I have chosen. And catch the operative word there. Behold my servant. You know, we just read through this Isaiah passage in Isaiah 53 as, during our prayer time, and Matthew earlier even quotes part of that in Matthew 8, 17. He says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Matthew also speaks of this suffering servant theme later in the book, but it is this reality that Jesus, with all of the authority that he had, with all of the power that he had, with the position that he rightfully claimed, yet he came to serve to suffer, and to serve. The scripture also tells us, right after that, it says, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. And it almost harkens back to that, that moment at Jesus' baptism where, where the father all of a sudden shows up and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus came and as a servant demonstrated exactly what it looked like to please the father in every way. And then it says this, and I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. There's this whisper of the mission of God. And this would have angered those Pharisees even more in this moment because the Messiah for Israel was supposed to rise up and deliver the people of Israel. He was supposed to save them from their captivity, from their slavery, putting away Rome and all of the enemies. This was to usher in this new kingdom for the people of God. And yet Jesus, when he appears, there's this whisper of the mission to say, know that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Because the Gentiles is everyone else. Not only is he for the Jewish people, but he is for the world. I love the song this time of year, Joy to the World. I hope you hear it a lot. One of the reasons I love it is because my middle daughter, or middle child, our youngest daughter, thinks it's about her because her name's Joy. But we often focus on that word joy. What about that next phrase, to the world? It is for all. And Jesus comes and he breaks down barriers. And it doesn't matter the color of your skin or your nationality, the language that you speak, your country of origin, none of that matters. You are created in the image of God, Made male and female, he created them. 
The beauty of that, that Jesus comes for the world that he came to serve. And the scripture goes on and tells us a little bit more about this. What does this mean as he's coming in verse 19? It says, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. So why, what is, what is he talking about there? Because surely they had to hear the voice of Jesus as he taught. Surely his voice had to get loud at times as he's teaching on a hillside. It's not what the prophet is saying. What he's saying is there's going to be no vociferous debate. There's going to be no moment where he's in a yelling match with the Pharisees saying, no, my way is right, not your way, my way, not your way. And if you know Middle Eastern culture, that's often the way it goes. But what Jesus did is he quietly did his ministry and he preached good news and he healed people and he met them right where their need was and he changed lives and the crowds began to follow as Jesus fulfilled what he came for. Why does it matter that there was no boisterous debate in the streets. Because Jesus essentially said this in the way he came. This isn't about me. This is about the plan of redemption. And yes, he's the center of the story. But Jesus came in humility. I catch this out of... Philippians chapter 2, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The one with authority, power, and position humbled himself. I think that's why it's so refreshing that Jesus isn't impressed by us. No matter what kind of clothes we wear, car we drive, no matter what position we hold at work or in the community, no matter how popular we may be at school or amongst friend groups, no matter what position we think we have attained in life, Jesus isn't impressed by that. He doesn't look on the things of the outside. He looks their hearts. And he modeled what a life of humility and service looked like. I think part of the issue that the Pharisees had, we can all agree that most of us in this life will probably not be the best at whatever we do. Right? There's always going to be someone that's a better salesperson. There's always going to be someone that probably runs their company more efficiently. There's always going to be someone that's a better real estate agent or a better uh, teacher or administrator. Somebody who's going to be a better student right now. Whatever that is, there's always going to be someone that's better. And we're kind of okay with that because it's okay when we look up and think, well, that person is above me, right? And we set this order, this kind of pecking order in life because if we acknowledge there's someone better than us, then we have to also acknowledge there's a lot of people underneath us that really should be serving us. And what Jesus did with the greatest position, power, and authority was turn that over. And he said, I am going to serve those whom the world would consider least. How does he do it? Verse 20. It says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Now, for most of us, we just go, absolutely, I get that. No, I'm kidding. That's one of those things you read and you go, what does he mean by that? A bruised reed he won't break and a smoldering wick he won't quench. Well, in their time period, a reed, which would have grown kind of by you know, a pond or by uh, the Sea of Galilee or something, it is a stick that usually was kind of hollow but still very strong. Think maybe bamboo. And so you would have this stick and it would be cut to a perfect length because the two major uses for a reed in that day, one was a measuring rod and one was a cane. Right, so we get the easy point of the cane, and then the measuring rod, you wanted to have something that was standard that you could see, okay, we know when we're measuring land or we're measuring cloth or whatever that it's going to be a fair measure. What happens with a bruised reed? It bends, not to the point of breaking, but it bends, and so it becomes a problem because now you can't get an adequate measure. And maybe you've been there with the measuring tape. Right? And there's a part of the room you want to measure, but you can't quite get to it because it has a bunch of furniture or whatever in the way. And so you start reeling it out. Right? And have you tried to get it as far as possibly can? You've got the ark in it. Right? You're just trying to grab that other wall, whatever it is, that will be able to pull it tight. And then what happens? One foot too many. 
it breaks, right? And the loud noise, and you get frustrated, it gets caught on something inevitably, and all that. Well, that's the same concept that it's not a right measure anymore. And so what would you do with the bruised reed? It's certainly not going to be a cane. You throw it out. What about a smoldering wick? Well, think of a candle, right? And the wick, maybe it's a cloth piece that's doused in oil, put around the wax, or the wax around it so it burns slowly. But the point of that was to provide light to the house. That if you're walking around, that's the only light you have. There's no switch to turn on. With a smoldering wick, basically, it won't provide light anymore. It's just that, that orange glowy part that just produces smoke. Have you ever had that? You blow out a candle in your house and you think you're going to set the smoke alarms off because it just keeps billowing this black smoke. And you're like, why won't it go out? It's not good for anything. It's just creating pollution. And that's exactly the illustration. And yet, what does Jesus do? It says, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Here's the metaphor. Jesus came for the broken. He came for the hurting. He came for those who had made a mess of their lives. He came for those who have sinned, which, by the way, what we read in Isaiah 53 is every single one of us, because all of us in our own life and in our own lordship of our journey will choose ways that will mess everything up. And we may look so great on the outside, but you know it when you're that person, you go to bed at night and you say, I'm a fake, I'm a fraud, I've ruined my life. And Jesus says, that's who I came for. Because when you are in that pit, because of your own choices and the destructive things that we all choose from time to time, sometimes we get this confusion and we get this idea that God is somehow in heaven as this tyrannical judge who's just up there looking down at us and saying, that's what you deserve. Or maybe he's just an ambivalent God who, who folds his arms in the corner of heaven and looks down and says, look what you got yourself into, now what are you going to do? No, the biblical picture of God is one that so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us so that anyone who would confess him as Savior and Lord, believing that God raised him from the dead, we would have eternal life. And essentially, it's in the muck of our own lives and choices. Jesus reaches down and says, I love you. I came for you. I died for you. And I made you, and I'm the only one who can give you real hope. So would you take my hand? And it's this picture of Jesus saying, I came for the broken, because I can provide healing. Let me just ask you, is that you? Are you at a place, if you were honest with yourself and anyone around you, you'd say, I'm broken. Do you know what Jesus does? It literally, the scripture says that he makes us new. It's like the reset button. That doesn't mean all the consequences of our previous life goes away, but it means in this moment, you can have new life and it lasts forever. How? By believing, by faith that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did come, that he did die, and that he was raised from the dead for you, and that his death on that cross, it covers your sin. And then it says the scripture, that if you confess him as Savior and Lord, which means, Jesus, you are now the ruler of my life. Forgive me for my sin. I will follow you. And he makes us new, and we walk in newness forever. And by the way, that is for those who have not received Christ and can find that life today. And it is also for those of us who have received Christ and yet have somewhere chosen to walk in a path of disobedience before him. That every time he still pulls us out and says, my grace is sufficient for you. A smoldering wick, a bruised reed. He came for the broken and then it brings these last couple of simple phrases there in the text this morning. It says, in the end of verse 20, until he brings justice 
to victory, until he brings justice to victory. And that word justice, especially in our time, is a heavy, weighted word in these moments. So what does it mean there? Well, first of all, we have to understand that our God is a God of justice. Scripture tells us that over and over again. Psalm 9, 7, and 8, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. Psalm 82, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Over and over and over again, we could read verse after verse that talks about the justice and the righteousness of God. And so when the scripture says that Jesus brings justice to victory, how is justice victorious? Let me just make it a personal example. You see, I have sinned. I'm stained. I can't see rightly. And I think I have a good idea of what justice looks like, but there's still a stain on me of sin. And there's a problem. And and let me even extrapolate it out this way, if I can, that the most righteous judge who sits maybe on the Supreme Court, an appellate court, a local court, whatever, the most righteous judge is going to get some things wrong sometimes. The jury that has the most integrity, that all 12 of them are doing their absolute very best to decide a case rightly, at times are going to convict somebody who doesn't deserve to be convicted. The greatest defense lawyer who operates with the most integrity, that's not a joke, (laughs) at some point he may defend a client who actually committed the crime and yet he's acquitted because of the skill of the defense lawyer. We can't see the hearts of people like God can. And for us to render justice, we will always fall short. So let me go back to the personal example. You see, what justice I deserve is death and to fall under the wrath of God because I sinned against a holy God as his creature. And yet what God did is he said, I see you in need of deliverance and redemption, and I'll send my son Jesus. And as Jesus came, he steps in between me and God, and on the cross, he delivered me and brought justice to victory in my life. Because what I receive now is not justice, but the grace and mercy of God, because Jesus received all of the justice of God that I deserved. He brought justice to victory. And he will do that for all who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you still might ask this question, yeah, I get that, but I don't see justice in the world around me. How can we even say that God has brought justice to victory? What does this look like in the world around me? Well, let's tackle that in three simple things. First is personal justice. You know, the beauty of having Christ as your Lord and Savior is that you no longer have to defend yourself and you no longer have to prove to everyone else your value and worth because God's already proclaimed it on the cross. And so I can go through life, and you know what? When someone wrongs me, I don't have to make it right because God is a far better judge than I am. And I rest in what Jesus has done. He's brought justice to victory in my life. And it's the same for all who follow him. So personally, Jesus gives peace and rest in the fact that we don't have to fight for justice. He delivers it. So what about justice for others then? We think about that personally now, justice for others. As Christ followers, we should fight for the justice in the world around us. We should strive for equality and fairness. We should strive to treat every other person as we would want to be treated, as the scripture says. And not only that, but that we would fight for them when they are not treated well, that we as Christ followers should do that. I do want to say it with this understanding, that if you're having a conversation with somebody about justice, we need to define the word justice, because in our world, oftentimes we're approaching this with two very different definitions. As Christ followers, we see justice biblically. And so we have to be careful. But as Christ followers, we would fight for justice. And then the third thing, what about the big picture of justice in the world, right? Evil existing and why God doesn't just act and move. Here's the reality. He is going to bring justice. 
and set everything right. But please hear me. If you are not a follower of Jesus, that is not a good day for you. Because you aren't under the covering of the blood of Christ. And you will bear the full justice and wrath that you deserve if it has not been under, put under Jesus by you trusting him as Lord and Savior. Why does evil exist in the world? Why is there still suffering and struggle? Because God is patient. Because God doesn't enjoy injustice and seeing it happen on the earth, but he is patient knowing that when Jesus returns and all is made right and justice is brought to its fullest and final victory at that point, that there is no longer a time for those who are apart from God to find salvation in Jesus. And so he waits. And if you're hearing that and you're not a Christ follower, he waits for you. And what you're feeling in your heart is that longing to be restored with the one who made you and to find true peace and rest in him. And the last word in verse 21, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Hope is only fulfilled in Jesus. So let me ask you this question. Who are you or what are you hoping in today? And if you say, you know what, I'm hoping in Jesus, then today when you spend time with him, because if you have your set, your hopes set on him, you'll spend time with him. Then he'll shape you to look a little more like him. And then when you set your hope on him tomorrow, he's going to shape you a little bit more to look like Jesus. Then when you set your hope on him that next day and the next day and the next day, he's going to shape you a little bit more until the friends that you have and the coworkers that have and the people around you in your neighborhood, they're going to see something drastically different. They're going to see Jesus in you because you have set your hope on him. Because friends, here is the truth. Our world doesn't need to see religious hope. It needs to see hope fulfilled in Jesus as we passionately live for him. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're in this room or you're at home, I just want to encourage you, if you're wrestling right now because you recognize that you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, maybe it was Mary's baptism that you know about him, but you don't know him. You can know him today. For those of you in the room, our Stephen ministers will be outside the doors at the end of our service. You can talk with them. For those who are at home, I just encourage you to text PH Life to 77411. And we'll reach out to you and begin to have the conversation that can literally change your eternity. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this amazing reminder that Jesus came and he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. God, would we choose to look like our Savior? Would we serve the world around us? And would we serve them with the good news of the gospel that they too may find eternal life and peace in you? Thank you for this reminder in this season at Christmas. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can at parkwayhills.org. If you'd like to visit us, you can worship with us online or in person every Sunday at 9 or 10.30 a.m. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you soon.